we have the opportunity to listen to Professor Moises Sklow, because Professor Sklow, Sklow, who is a professor of epidemiology, as I said, of Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and a long-standing, and I can add, famous epidemiologist, uh, he has agreed to deliver the advice to the young scientist, right. Professor Sklow. Thank you. It is really a pleasure to be here tonight, and I actually recognize some of the students who took my course on case control studies. Hello, and congratulations, too. And I, I'd like to thank Dr. Hoffman, Professor Hoffman, for the very kind invitation. It means a real pleasure to be in Rotterdam over and over again. I don't think I'll ever tire of Rotterdam and Erasmus. Erasmus is such a great place, such a great university. And so it's, to me, it's a privilege to be invited every year to teach a course. So one of the nice things, maybe the only nice thing about old age is that you can pontificate. So that's what I'm going to do over the next 10 minutes. I'm going to pontificate, give you some advice. And some of the advice is going to be scientific and some advice is going to be philosophical, conceptual. So the first thing I should uh, tell you is that, from my experience, you have to be humble because you're going to be involved in studies. And your study is only one of many possible studies. And remember, replication is the soul of science. So I think this is terribly important. The second piece of advice is absolutely crucial. You have to recognize the contribution of your mentors. It's absolutely important to do that. And I love this paragraph uh, that was attributed to a 12th century theologian, John of Salisbury. We are like doors sitting on the shoulders of giants. We see more in things that are more distant than they did, not because our sight is superior or because we are taller than they, but because they raise us up and by, they, by their great stature add to, our, to ours. Research, many, many of us do, you know, is observational in nature. So I think it's terribly important once you get involved in research, observational research particularly, to be very careful with causal inferences. And I want to show you that Snoopy understands that. So he makes the right causal inference. So he's saying, he's looking at this little bird, and he's saying Woodstock is searching for his identity. We know he's not an eagle because he can't stand heights. And then he jumps into the lake, and Snoopy concludes, another thing, he's not a duck, because <laughs> he sinks. And remember, associations are not effects. So if you write your paper based on a cohort study or a case control study, uh, please remember not to talk about effect size. Talk about statistical associations. They may or may not be causal. So when you describe the results, for, single from single observational studies, avoid the expressions that imp imply causality, such as effect size or protective effect instead of inverse relationship. So I think this is terribly important. So observational research has problems in terms of causal inference, but remember that a lot of what we know in epidemiology and public health comes from replication of observational studies. So there are lots of uh, policies that are based on observational data. You know, the indoor smoking ban, decreased salt content in baby foods, radiation exposure standards, and so on and so forth. So observational research is terribly important, but you cannot make causal inference on the basis of one single observational study. Beware of ecological fallacy. So ecological fallacy means something really interesting. Correlation doesn't imply causation. And I want to show you some examples of very strong correlation, ecological correlations, that are, makes no sense. For example, the relationship between divorce rate in Maine, which is an American state, and per capita consumption of margarine has a, has a correlation coefficient almost perfect, 0.99. Another example is the relationship between per capita consumption of mozzarella cheese and the civil engineering doctorates awarded in the United States. That has also a correlation coefficient of 0.99. Now, the most, the most striking example is this. And I, I don't think anyone can guess what this is. This is the relationship between number of storks 
and the size of the human population. And it has a correlation, with, you know, storks are the animal, those, those birds that bring babies, okay? So here, <laughs> you see a correlation between number of storks and the size of the human population with a very high correlation coefficient. Uh, and this is a real study, this is not an invention of mine. So I, I say beware of ecological fallacy, but not all ecological correlations are ecological fallacies. And I just want to give an example. In observational studies, where within population variability of an exposure or an outcome is small, what happens is that if all individuals or most individuals are having the same salt intake, for example, you wouldn't be able to see a relationship with blood pressure. It's like, you know, you can't do a study of smoking and disease if, I have, if every, everybody smokes. So this is important. And sometimes the ecological correlations give you the right results. For example, you have four populations. In each population, the range of exposure to salt intake is very small. So within each population, when you look at correlation amongst individuals, there is no correlation. But if you look at means of different populations, then you see a correlation. And that's exactly what happens with salt intake and, and blood pressure. Be reader friendly in your papers and presentations. That's terribly important. Be simple. Be clear. Read your paper several times and ask somebody else to read it too. And one of the things that I do with my papers, I ask somebody else in an area different from mine to read it. So that, that if that individual doesn't understand it, that means the general, the in general, the epidemiologist, the average epidemiologist won't be able to understand it either. You want to reach as many people as possible. And you do that by being simple. So Einstein's sound advice, things have to be simple, as simple as possible, but not simpler. What does it mean? Be as clear as possible in your papers and presentations. Very important advice to you. I'm sure you're going to be involved in paper writing because, you know, with the with a degree from Erasmus, you expect it to produce scientifically very well. And a very important advice is that most reviewers and editors review, review papers only once. So you have to be as clear as possible. Otherwise, you know, kaput. <laughs> this, is, this is a table that I got from a, from a paper submitted to the American Journal of Epidemiology. Frankly, I think it's incomprehensible. So the reader is asking you to define what the beta coefficient is, plus, you know, the title is completely uninformative. What are the units? Age, one year, five years, cholesterol, smoking, how many categories of smoking? Uninterpretable by most people, useful for prediction and testing. So coefficients of regression models, they are very useful for prediction and testing, but not for understanding the measure of association after adjustment. And then, why do you need the standard error, the chi-square, and the p-value? It's redundant, right? So here we have a table in which we have units. We have estimates of the relative risk. or well, the hazard ratio, you have 95% confidence intervals. So this is the, ta the table that became the table that was eventually published in the American Journal of Epidemiology. So, The other thing that you have to be careful about, we all have a tendency to rank. So we see three variables, and age, the hazard ratio for age is 2.4, for cholesterol is 1.5, and so on. So we have, to have a, we have a tendency to say, to look at those values and say smoking was most strongly associated with coronary heart disease. Because as you see, the relative risk or the hazard ratio for smoking is the highest. But that doesn't make any sense. It depends on the unit that you're using. If instead of 10 years for age, you use 20 years for age, age becomes the most important variable. So it's very hard to compare association strengths. Avoid doing that, okay? Be reader friendly in your papers and presentations and also succinct. Be short, okay? Paper should be as short as possible. Editors and reviewers love short papers. This is very important because they usually have a lot of papers to review. 
And you know, I'm going to show you a letter that was variously attributed to Pascal, to Mark Twain, or to Voltaire, in which they, one of them writes to a friend and says, dear friend, I'm sorry that I have written you such a long letter. I did not have any time to write you a short one. And we all know the first draft of our papers is much longer than the second draft, which is also much longer than the third draft. And I really don't believe when authors say to me as an editor, because I'm also an editor, that they cannot shorten their paper. You can always shorten your paper. And you know, uh, this is an example of uh, <laughs> how you should not write a paper. This is against Snoopy. You, you have realized that I'm a great admirer of Snoopy. Snoopy writes, those years in Paris were to be among the finest of her life. He's writing a novel. Looking back, she once remarked, those years in Paris were among the finest of my life. That was what she said when she looked back upon those years in Paris, where she spent some of the finest years of her life. So, you know, I think this <laughs> needs a little attitude, a lot of attitude. And you know, a few years ago, I asked one of the editors of the American Journal of Epidemiology to take a paragraph that we had published. This is, was published and try to shorten it. So he shortened it from 73 words to 44 words. So when I looked at it, I shortened it further to 33 words. And I'm going to, uh, do I have time? I still have time, okay. So I'm going to read the whole paragraph. Other investigations exploring the association between multiparita and scleroderma, which is an autoimmune disease, have obtained information on multiparita using surrogate measures. The amount of money spent on diapers, that's cute, right? Without consideration of inflation has been used as a proxy by several groups of investigators. And all have reported that no significant difference were observed once the data was stratified by age at last full-term full pregnancy. Similar results were found in the analysis and reported here. Shortened. Other investigators have used surrogate multiparity measures. Example, amount spent on diapers without inflation adjustment. As with our study, no significant difference were revealed upon stratification by age at last full-term full -term pregnancy. I think the meaning is even clearer. And instead of 73 words, we have 33 words, so it's less than half. So keep that in mind. The shorter, the better, as long as you don't uh, obscure the meaning of the, what you're writing. So again, Snoopy is trying to write. It, it was thinking, thinking. It was a dark thinking, thinking. It was a dark and stormy night. So good writing a hard work, right? <laughs> it's not easy. And finally, I want to uh, show you other, another, uh, uh, I think this is, uh, how do you call that? Lucy and somebody else two children, and she's saying, this is a hard world to get along with. I don't feel sorry for all the new little scientists. I, I changed the, <laughs> the dialogue. This is just for you, you know, it's special for you. But they keep right on getting born. Look at that. I mean, how many, 80 some little scientists here being born? Little and bright, of course. Do you realize that somewhere at this very moment a scientist is being born? Good luck, kid, wherever you are. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much to your address to a young scientist. Actually, it's a very good advice to all other scientists present here as well. Thank you very much.